Hello again, friends, and thanks for stopping by. We get a lot of feedback from our viewers and subscribers on what they'd like us to do. An interest in the Ford Bronco from way back in 1966 up until today's models is always high on the list. We're also fans of the Bronco and can remember when the first one hit dealer showrooms nearly 60 years ago. In that time, Ford has issued many different promotional and special interest models. Here's the best ones, at least in our opinion. So sit back and enjoy reminiscing about this legendary sport utility vehicle with us. Although the Ford Bronco is not considered the first sport utility vehicle, it's certainly one of the most iconic. The enthusiasm for the Bronco is at an all-time high. From the first models in 1966 to today's rugged off-road examples, people just love Broncos. In year order, here are the top 10 Broncos, at least in our opinion. Tell us in the comments whether you agree with our choices or not. If not, which Broncos did we miss? But here we go. Nineteen sixty six was the introductory year for the Bronco. How it all came about is a fascinating story. As you probably know, the US government had contracted with both Ford and Willis to build Jeeps for the war effort in World War II. Parts had to be interchangeable from one to the other for seamless interchangeability in the field. Many people considered the Ford to be of higher quality, so they were especially sought after as surplus when the war ended. Fast forward to the end of the 1950s when people really began recreating in the outdoors with activities like camping, fishing, hiking, and hunting, to name a few. There were certainly improvements made since the World War II Jeep, but they still lacked features that more and more Americans were demanding. International Harvester debuted the Scout in 1961, and along with the classic Willis Jeep, these two models were all that buyers in this new market had. So in 1963, Ford surveyed many of the buyers of these vehicles to find out what features they liked, which ones were not up to expectations, and which features were lacking completely. With this data, plans were made to bring a totally new vehicle to the market. Initial design drawings were completed by McKinley Thompson, the first black American that Ford had hired for a design team. These drawings were tweaked countless times, and the final design drawings looked very similar to the production vehicle, which isn't often the case. The first generation Bronco began as a vehicle that would be offered in three distinct body styles throughout its long production run. All would be four-wheel drive. During that time, Ford offered them as a wagon, a half cab, which they ceased production of in 1972, and a roadster. The popular sport model was first seen as an option in 1967, but by 1970, it was its own model. At first, they were only powered by the 200 cubic inch 6, the same engine found in Fairlanes, Falcons, Mustangs, and similar Mercuries. Later in the year, Ford would offer the 289 V8. By 1968, the 302 would replace it. Until the end of production in 1977, the 206 and the 302 were the only engines available. In 1973, an automatic transmission Power steering and front disc brakes were first seen on the option list. These were very popular options, and as the Bronco evolved, it got more features, models, and colors so that every buyer could option his or her Bronco exactly as they wanted it. Bill Strop, who through many years of racing Ford products in many different forms of motorsports, was essentially Ford's West Coast performance shop that built race cars and tested new Ford products, among many other things. When the Bronco debuted, Strop immediately used it as a platform to create the ultimate desert racer. There were two races that were the big events for this type of racing, the Baja 500 and the Baja 1000. Strop had won them both 
several times. These winds piqued Ford's interest, and it was soon decided that Strop would offer his own vehicles through Ford and their dealer network. It's believed that every Ford dealer was able to order one. Ford marketed these special Broncos as a, quote, limited production duplicate, unquote, of the actual Strop team trucks. All a buyer had to do was to complete the order form, and the dealer would submit it to Ford, just like any other vehicle. They were available from 1971 to 75. Ford built a semi-completed Sport Bronco with custom tritone paint that was then sent to Strop's shop in Long Beach, California to complete the conversion. All were 302 V8s and were also equipped with a heavy-duty cooling package, heavy-duty suspension, and a reduced-tone exhaust system. Once at Strop, his team would install a C4 automatic and power steering. Once these two options were available in 73, all Baja Broncos would come from the factory with these options. In addition, the Strop team added rear fender flares and trimmed the front fenders to clear the huge for the time Gates Commando XT off-road tires. The wheels were either painted steelies or slotted mags with a size of 8.5 by 15. Also installed on each Bronco were dual shocks at each wheel, additional front bumper bracing, a padded roll bar, a rubberized grip steering wheel, and a trailer hitch. At the time, Strop was well known in the off-road community, so he put together a catalog of everything he'd sell and install to make off-roading safer and more fun. Because each vehicle was built to spec, it's doubtful that any two Baja Broncos left his shop with all the same equipment. How many were built is unknown, but knowledgeable enthusiasts estimate between 500 and 650. Not many are left. It's always a treat to see one at a show. The Denver Bronco Bronco has a unique story. Let us preface this by saying not much information is available online, so we piece this brief history together using logic and with some knowledge of how dealer-made special edition vehicles were marketed and sold. So here's the story. Golden Ford, located in a far western suburb of Denver, Colorado, had a very aggressive fleet sales manager. Being a small dealership in a small town that's best known for brewing Coors beer, they had to be creative to outsell their much bigger Denver area competitors. Legend says that sometime in November of 74, Ford had lost the relationship they had with Bill Strop. As stated, Strop and Ford parted ways, but Ford still had 77 custom painted Broncos already built to send to Strop for Baja Bronco conversions. It seems they wouldn't be going to Long Beach, California. Ford sent letters out to dealers to see if they could eventually get rid of all of them. Golden Ford ordered one of these Broncos because the price was so attractive. They had been selling the Strop Bajas for the past few years, and many that they sold were fans of the NFL team in the city, the Denver Broncos. The team's colors were very similar to the Bajas, so taking a chance, the plan was to acquire a Baja and put Denver Bronco related items on it like fender decals and a spare tire cover with the team's logo. It sold immediately and Golden Ford ordered the other units. All arrived between December 8th and December 21st of 1974. The conversions were done quickly and inexpensively and other local dealers also sold them when it was obvious that local NFL fans were buying them up. Once the supply of Strop Broncos was exhausted, the dealership could only order additional units in all white for them to do additional paintwork. Ford refused to paint them in tritone colors anymore. Since Golden Ford didn't keep track of VINs in their final dispositions, nobody really knows how many were made. A simple VIN check with Marty won't tell you anything either. The only way to document a real Denver Bronco Bronco is with original paperwork or finding one with the aforementioned decals. We're both from the Denver area and can clearly remember seeing a few of these in the area during the mid-70s. If you know more about these, 
please share it in the comments. By the time the new second gen upsized Bronco hit the market, Ford had been competing with the full size Chevrolet Blazer, the GMC Jimmy, and the Dodge Ram Charger models for several years with their smaller first gen Broncos. It was high time for Ford to offer their iconic Bronco in a size that consumers wanted. People demanded more room, a higher towing capacity in GVW, and more options and color choices. Ford wisely chose this next Bronco to use many components of the F-Series trucks, saving tremendous amounts of money for development and tooling costs. Now both the pickup and the SUV would look similar, just like the GM and Dodge models had for several years. There were now two engine choices, both V8s. The inline 306 would have to wait until 1980. There were also two trannies available, a manual four-speed truck type box or the three-speed automatic. A well-rounded group of option choices to appeal to nearly every buyer were available. From 1978 until the end of Bronco production in 1996, all would be based on the F-Series. These trucks sold extremely well and many specialty models came from these years, which we'll discuss further in this video. From 1966 until 1979, Ford, in some instances, considered the Bronco a passenger car. For example, all of the OEM replacement parts catalogs listed the Bronco with other models in the passenger car line. From 1980 to present day, all parts were catalogued with the truck parts books. This was strictly an appearance package only. Most of the same drivetrains and other options were still available on these trucks as they were on other models. This was the era of personalized vehicles, particularly trucks. Dodge had their line of sport utility vehicles called Adult Toys, and they proved very popular. Although the stripes and colors would change year to year and model to model, they sure do make a statement to anybody looking at it, and they still demand attention today. After all, getting looks from others is one of the main reasons to customize a car or truck. This package was either called free wheeling or free wheeling, depending on the advertisement, the brochure, the year, and the model. Most featured various custom decal stripes and pinstripes, custom wheels, blacked out features like the grill, headlamp surrounds, outside mirrors, bumpers and window trim, plus custom interiors. Ford dubbed them as dazzling, which they certainly were. Offered in a limited run in a wide variety of formats from 1977 to 81, these vehicles were very popular when new, and all these years later are rarely seen and a bit of a novelty that accurately reflects the car industry at the time. Free wheeling was available on the F100, F150, Bronco, Econoline, and Courier Pickup. There was even a freewheeling Ford Pinto cruising wagon, matching the Econo line in color, stripe colors and design, special convex side windows, and more. These vehicles were all selected because Ford wanted customers to see themselves using their favorite vehicles to go out and have fun recreating in the great outdoors. Generally, most had option packages that included different things, and most had more than one option for stripes, too. So for five short years, Ford offered some of the most comprehensive visual packages in the industry. With their hands tied for horsepower and performance, the only option manufacturers had at the time was to add cosmetics. This did, however, spawn an entire industry of what's called sticker cars. This is the era we grew up in, and we love these types of vehicles. Although Ford had used several different famous fashion designers for various Lincolns beginning with the Mark IV, trucks were always considered utility type vehicles. The need to jazz them up with designer names and special features was just never done at Ford. However, during this time, the world-renowned Eddie Bauer Company, based in Seattle, Washington, 
was lending their name and logo to help sell many different outdoor oriented items like bicycles, eyewear, and furniture. Because Bauer was a premier brand for people that enjoyed outdoor recreations and sports, it would be a perfect fit for a new model aimed at a different marketing demographic. A deal was cemented with Ford starting in 1985, where the Eddie Bauer name and logo would be seen on the Bronco, the Bronco 2, and the F-Series. This partnership lasted through 2010 and would also include excursions, expeditions, and explorers as well. As far as the Bronco and the Bronco 2, this package was easily identified by simply looking at the vehicle. It varies by year and model, but these special vehicles were usually available in most of the standard exterior colors offered for the similar models. But if the lower portion is painted a medium tan, or Pueblo gold as Ford called it, it was an Eddie Bauer. Usually the front and rear bumper also had trim painted in that same color. Inside the seats were of a rugged material and carried the Eddie Bauer logo in them. These trucks had all of the finest in equipment, most of it standard, and high quality accessories to enhance the ownership experience. When new, these models commanded a premium price, but since they're all used now and are between the ages of 15 and 40 years old, there are many available to choose from. They're not hard to find and now this package no longer commands the premium it once did. So go on and find a nice one and know that you'll get the best Ford had to offer from that year of that truck. Ford realized that even in the mid 70s, consumers were shifting to larger vehicles en masse and other than some full-size cars and station wagons, Ford, along with Chrysler and American Motors, were all in the same boat. Only General Motors had a distinct advantage with their Suburban, which had been in production in this configuration for many years. They owned that market. Development for Ford would begin decades into the future, but for now, a good-sized independent company called Centurion would bridge the gap. Although there were a few other small conversion companies, they didn't have what it took to complete truck conversions in a timely and economical manner. For Centurion, doing these Ford conversions would prove to be relatively easy. With a sturdy full ladder frame and bodies with simple body lines, they soon went to work taking a base model crew cab pickup and mating it with the Bronco rear body and top section. Of course, there were a number of finish procedures required to give the Ford Centurion a factory appearance. Inside, most models offered nine passenger seating by maintaining the stock Bronco bench seat at the back. By checking the right boxes, a customer could get more captain's chairs installed, but that conversion couldn't seat as many passengers. To increase profits and give customers a fully loaded truck, Centurion was making healthy profits once their team was intimately familiar with the process. Any Ford V8 could be optioned, along with a plethora of factory options. As time went on from their 1987 four-door Bronco debut, Centurion would eventually replace the Bronco's fiberglass top for a more durable steel. Although the conversions added quite a bit of money to the purchase price, they were very well done and just the thing for loyal Ford customers who needed more space and towing capacity but didn't want to buy from another automaker. The Ford Centurion had a huge advantage over GM that they couldn't overcome unless they redesigned and built a completely new one-ton people mover. Centurion utilized the F350 crew cab for conversion, creating a vehicle capable of towing 10,000 pounds and offering three rows of seating. The F-350 was 9 inches longer, so people could stow more cargo while enjoying a more stable ride. GM wouldn't have a similar one-ton vehicle for many years. Centurion began its relationship with Ford when they started doing E-Series van conversions in the early 80s. Four-door Bronco conversion went on for a decade and proved to be advantageous for both companies. 
However, when Ford introduced the expedition in 97, there was little need for the services of Centurion. By 2006, Centurion would join forces with one of its biggest truck rivals, Southern Comfort Conversions. Thus ended a company that contributed greatly to the pickup and SUV market we have today. Ford anticipated celebrating the silver anniversary of the legendary Bronco in 1991, which was coincidentally the last year of the 8th generation models, so plans were made to offer a special model. In the end, it was merely a cosmetic package, but Ford speculated that many loyal Bronco owners would want one. There was only one exterior paint color, a beautiful shade of red called Current Red. You'd think a silver anniversary model would be silver, like the 1978 Chevrolet Pace Car Corvette in 1978. Inside, these special trucks had a gray leather interior. It's reported that some did have cloth interiors, but we'd suspect a special commemorative model like this would be leather, a first for the Ford Bronco. Special badging consisting of an emblem placed under each front fender's Bronco emblem that stated the unique model's name along with a circular emblem on each side panel where the grabber bars are. It's estimated that only about 3,000 were made. There wasn't much promotion at the time to let potential buyers know such a model existed, so few of the total Bronco production of 25,001 that year had this distinction. By the late 1980s, Ford, like the rest of the auto industry, knew that even though production costs may be higher and fewer units would be sold, developing special edition vehicles, either cars or trucks, generates enthusiastic press coverage and draws potential buyers into showrooms, even if they have no intention of buying one. An interesting sub-series of the F-150 and Bronco was the new for 91 Night Edition. It was seen for only two model years, but spanned the 8th and 9th generation trucks. The night models were essentially a cosmetic package. In the F-150, any cab and bed combination could be ordered as a night, and both two- and four-wheel drives were available. The base engine for both the Bronco and the pickup was a 302 V8 with an automatic transmission. Most regular options were still available. The night package consisted of an XLT Lariat-based truck with a black interior with special stripes and two different two-tone color combinations, and the model name and decals on the rear quarters also in two-tone colors to match the stripes. Unfortunately, these models didn't sell well. Consumers realized that other than some cosmetics, they were essentially the same as their brethren trucks, which, depending on the model, or less expensive. So by the end of 92, the package was gone. Because of the limited production, these make for an interesting collectible that won't cost an entry-level enthusiast a ton of money. Even experienced enthusiasts would like to find one of these. The newest iteration of the Ford Bronco is meant to fulfill most any consumer's idea of what the perfect Bronco is. First, there's the Bronco Sport. Smaller than the standard Bronco and only available as a four-door, these SUVs have sold extremely well and continue to do so. Then there's the full-size Bronco, available as both a two or a four-door in a huge variety of models and packages. These vehicles all came along in 2021 after Ford opted to revive the iconic name and brand the Bronco has been in hibernation since the end of 1996. At the time, it was only available as a large two-door model. Two-door SUVs never sold well for any company, so the Bronco was replaced by the newly designed Expedition in 97, a vehicle with not only more carrying capacity, but also more modern in appearance and function. It was an instant success. But like the earlier revived Thunderbird, and some of the various Mustangs and Shelbys of late, Ford realizes that many of 
Their loyal and longtime customers are nostalgic for products of the past. With a mix of traditional design and features, but also modern features as well. The new Broncos do that fairly well, even with four doors instead of two. First year sales were dominated by the Bronco Sport because the Bronco was having production problems related to the supply chain issues associated with it. The next year, things improved immensely, and Ford knew that loyal customers as well as new and younger buyers really wanted something next level. Although the base Bronco isn't exactly subtle and is offered in many different subseries to cover all of Ford's bases in this huge market segment, they'll all blend seamlessly into everyday life for most buyers. But there are always those people that demand even more. Enter the Bronco Raptor. It really stands out not only for the Ford offerings, but virtually every other SUV out there as well. It's as subtle as a sledgehammer in a wood shop glass. Inspired by the high-performance, off-road ready Raptor version of the F-150 and Ranger pickups, the Bronco Raptor is far cooler, much more capable, a lot tougher, much thirstier, and yes, a lot more expensive than the standard Bronco. Here's the basics of what you'll need to know about this top of the food chain Bronco Raptor. It's only available in the larger four-door, five-passenger body style with a hard roof. Massive fender flares give the Raptor a wider stance than the base Bronco for superior stability over any type of terrain thanks to the capable off-road engineered suspension and the huge 17-inch wheels fitted with the knobby 37-inch off-road tires. In addition, rock rails and removable running boards are not only functional, but they look awesome too. To easily identify the Raptor from say another Bronco with upgraded rollers, this grille has distinctively large Ford block letters in a charcoal gray similar to the F-150 and Ranger. To the uninitiated, at first it may appear to be a visually only option package, as is often seen in the truck segment of the market. But there's much more than a macho looking image to this badass Bronco. Oh yes, much more. Every Raptor comes standard with a twin turbocharged 3 liter V6 and an automatic transmission. It's rated for 418 horsepower and 440 pound feet of torque. While the base Bronco can tow up to 3,500 pounds when properly equipped, the Raptor maxes out at 1,000 pounds more. Additional performance upgrades include a reinforced frame and cabin, skid plates, upgraded axles, Fox adaptive shocks, and performance brakes. The four-wheel drive system gets a locking rear differential and automatic on-demand engagement. Other standard handling enhancements include trail control, trail turn assist, hill start assist, one-pedal trail driving, electronic locking front and rear axles, and the ability to disconnect the front stabilizer bar. The Bronco Raptor is 73.2 inches wide up front, 73.6 inches wide at the rear, compared to the standard 65 inch track width of the base Bronco. This characteristic makes it more difficult to drive in urban situations where passageways may be narrow or you need to parallel park it. Unfortunately, to be a member of this elite group that has one, base price is very close to $100,000, which puts the Raptor in the price range of several import-exclusive SUVs. When researching all of these various Broncos, two questions come to mind. At the time of the Bronco F-Series production in 1993, 4, and 5, during the availability of the F-150 Lightning models, why didn't Ford also offer this model as a Bronco? All of the necessary suspension and brake parts were already there for the 150, so to offer the exact mechanical duplicate in a Bronco would have been easy. That would have been an awesome package, a two-wheel drive performance SUV, lowered for better handling. We had a 94 Lightning and loved it. 
The only way it could have been better is to have some additional room for gear and people. In theory, one could be created as a fantasy vehicle because there are many 9th gen Broncos still out there and the 1st gen Lightnings aren't that hard to find and pricing is quite attractive. But what a cool truck this would be. Now more difficult to speculate on this is the availability of a 460 in the 1978-96 to 96 Broncos. Sure, a 460 was available throughout these years in the F-Series, but Ford had engineered all of the necessary parts to easily install a 460 in a Bronco, but didn't. We had a 1976 heavy half-ton F-150 two-wheel drive that came from Ford with a 460, as well as an 87 and a 95 F-250 with this large displacement big block. But it was probably the ever-tightening emissions and CAFE, or that's corporate average fuel economy requirements, that put further restrictions on such vehicles. Again, that's a truck that someone could build with enough determination and money. Both of these fantasy vehicles would have been awesome. Which one would you prefer, and which of these Broncos is your favorite? Did we miss one that should be on the list? Just let us know in the comments. We read each one and love to engage with our viewers. Anyway, that wraps up this video on the top 10 most memorable Ford Broncos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.